Okay, thank you all for your patience and for staying with us. We are going to have the last session, final session, class four, if you will, for David Andrews, Practical Ways to Deal with Racism. Brother David, as many would know, is the current recording brother at the Georgetown Ecclesia in Guyana. He's lived and worked a number of years in the Caribbean, where he was uh, privileged to share in the preaching work over there. And he's also been a speaker at many Bible schools, fraternals, and campaigns uh, in North America. Uh, he asked me to leave off all of his uh, PhD qualifications, so we won't mention those. And we'll go straight into the session, Practical Ways to Deal with Racism. Brother David. Thank you, my dear brother Gideon even if I've had all of those PhDs of which you speak none of them would have been of any consequence for a talk like this good afternoon my dear brothers sisters and friends across virtual land we now come to our final installment on this matter of racism with the intention of producing a biblical perspective it needs to be made very clear at this point that this is not an attack in any wise upon white brethren or black brethren. We can testify for a fact that most of the brethren we know, Sister Joan and I in particular, we can assume the same for those we do not know, that there's no overt prejudice and no intention to be prejudicial to anyone. However, the reason for these talks today is to deal largely with the perceptions of our, particularly our young people, in light of the recent horrible scenes being displayed on the public media, which have engendered anger and confusion amongst them. They have seen these things with their own eyes and they need answers. Where are they to find these answers? At the street corner? Facebook, the gossip columns of the media, we the older brethren who have seen all of this play out before have an option to say nothing and hope things will eventually quiet down. But even if they do quiet down, the underlying passions and doubts have already been sown in ignorance and will only erupt at a later time with worse effects that can fragment the Ecclesia. I suggest we do not fear to handle the matter openly and dispassionately within our Ecclesia in pointing our young people in particular in the right direction. We may not succeed today in this task, but at least we would have done our duty to our Lord, who said in Matthew chapter five in his Beatitudes, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. When we ignore an issue, we open the way for further doubt, into which would step all sorts of lies and propaganda that can do far worse damage than the body, to the body of Christ. So let us at least try to see what ought to be done again within the ecclesia. And if I may say so, I wish to commend my, the previous three speakers, my brethren who have done such a wonderful job in laying the foundation for this final talk. Indeed, I dare say if there's any fear on my part that uh, much of which I would like to say, there has been some extent of overlapping. So that has rather eased me of a part of my task and burden. Most of us might have heard the story of the police officer who treated a black resident quite differently from a white neighbor during a disturbance in a luxury neighborhood. The black resident was forced to prove the house where he said he lived was indeed his own by placing his door key in the lock of his own front door and turning it open. Whereas the word alone of the white neighbor sufficient to prove his residency and no such evidence was asked for by the police. Racism, need I say, 
is an evil disease. But where did it come from, we may ask? It is bred from basic prejudice. And this was borne out by all three of the previous speakers to some degree or other. Where does prejudice come from? It comes from a natural competitive feeling of need to be better than others, at least to feel better than others. Be the best we exhort our children and with every good intention at their school, at their exams. We don't want B grades, we want A plus. In the Bible, we see it springs from the pride of life. John's first letter, chapter 2, verse 16, that uh, well-known passage, I think it was quoted by Brother Nigel, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. It was displayed first in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, 6 says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of it and she did eat. The pride of life. It follows that mankind would always find a way to express personal or group superiority over his fellow man. Now, this is interesting. If Africans were not picked on, then men would look for who they consider the next inferior. Race is just the first call. If there were only one race on all the earth, then the next, the next stop in line would be found. Maybe differences in tribes, or castes, or skin color, or eye color, or social standing. I repeat what was earlier quoted for us in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We, can we cannot escape the heart, my dear brethren. We cannot escape the heart or run from ourselves. To varying degrees, we are all guilty of prejudice. Yes, though we may deny it openly. We therefore must be brutally honest with ourselves and confronted with the word of God, which is the foremost source of all wisdom. Let us then look at the examples within the scriptures to see whether there are lessons for us to be learned in confronting this evil disease of racism. We will begin with the household of faith. I submit that for the brotherhood, this should be our major concern, not the protester in the, in the streets. What is the real question we have to answer here? Well, I will start up an ant's nest. Is there racial prejudice within our ecclesia? The ecclesia, I mean the global ecclesia. There's only one ecclesia. There's no Georgetown ecclesia that is God and New York ecclesia. There's one ecclesia, the body of Christ. We, are only, we only have different geographical locations for purposes of convenience. Is there racial prejudice within our religion? Most certainly not. Well, I can hear some of you thinking, he must be mad to dare ask that question, or he belongs to a different planet. What can we do about it? We can only do something about it after having admitted we are all exposed to its influence and are all guilty in some way. But would we admit to it? Some of us, by God's grace, have been able to confront and overcome it. Others, on both sides, white and black, if we may use that division conveniently, either have not recognized it or been honest to admit it, but rather have learned well how to conceal it. It's best not to be judgmental by looking around at others to see who is guilty, but instead examine our own selves to see where we may be contributing, contributing to it, at least the appearance of this evil. I would like to first of all deal with our perceptions and to see how we can easily be caught. 
Let us consider the problem from the very source. As I said, our inner perceptions, the origins of our thinking. And I'll take for this example, the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch, that story is to be found in Acts chapter eight between verses 26 and verse 29 for this purpose. What can we learn from this true Bible story? Our, our respective negative perceptions of the Ethiopian can be laid bare. Now, this was a black dignitary of very high governmental rank in a highly developed nation of the day, Ethiopia, who visited Jerusalem to worship. It was a journey of 1,500 to 2,000 miles. Now, if Cornelius was the first Gentile convert, as is traditionally accepted in Christian circles, and I have no reason to challenge that, then this man must have been a full Jew of Ethiopia, a land where there are many Jewish colonies. There were many Jewish colonies since the Babylonian captivity. Does this in itself come as a shock to you to think some Jews were actually black? History records the fact that Jews settled in many nations thousands of years ago, and giving varying degrees of intermarriage diffused into almost all nations of the earth. If we say the Ethiopian eunuch was a proselyte, as many people love to say, do we mean he was just converted to Christianity? If on the other hand, his black ancestors were African, going back to some while, why do we still refer to him as a proselyte? We do not consider the descendants of Ruth and Rahab, who of themselves were proselytes, marrying into the Jewish family or the Jewish race. Do we don't consider them as proselytes, do we? If we do, then we would be making the Lord Jesus Christ himself a proselyte also. And that would be simply ridiculous. The state of Israel had this problem after the 1967 Six Day War of Ethiopians making the claim of being Jews at the immigration border in order to enter the now free land that was regained from the Palestinians. That's a Six Day War. I was a teenager then, and I just distinctly remember tracking that war from the very first attack when Israel made a preemptive strike across the, across the Suez Canal and destroy, destroyed Gamal, Absa, Gamal Abdel Nasser's air force on the ground. These Jews who were now, these black Jews who were now coming into Israel, uh, they were being turned back until the immigration officers checked diligently, only to find that they were indeed genetically authentic Jews. They are known as the Falasha Jews, some as the better Israel Jews. Indeed, Falasha Jews date back to the Babylonian captivity. It is a fact that about 144,000 of them presently, as I speak, reside in the borders of Israel today with Jewish citizenship. It is said that many of these Jews living in Ethiopia were surprised to discover there are such a thing as white Jews at all. The fact is, Israel is not one race of people. They have become several peoples out of every nation and kindred and town. Yes, you've heard me right. They were indeed, they are indeed white Jews, but they're also black Jews. They are Indian Jews, Iranian Jews, even Chinese Jews. Yes, you have heard me correctly. I'm talking about biological Jews. I'm not talking about proselytes. These Chinese Jews are known as the Kaifeng Jews. You can check this on Google. All this proves, my dear brethren, sisters, friends, and young people, that if we are not careful, each of us can be guilty of unwitting prejudice because of what we have been taught or grew up seeing all our lives in our cities, in our films, in our books, etc. The point is, it can well creep into our very ecclesia and homes while we preach the love of God to the rest of the world and wonder why they do not readily accept it our way. 
Note carefully how many depictions of Christ in films and books is not only white, but blonde. As if to say a dark-haired white is not good enough. And they have the deepest blue eyes. Is that supposed to be so significant? This mentality easily permeates society. This is the point I'm making. From the conscious mind deep into our subconscious, to the extent that after years of acceptance, even the victim accepts it as fact. What can we do about this danger? Well, we must first of all re recognize that we have all become unwitting victims of prejudicial assumptions based on what we have both heard and seen, maybe all our lives and taken for granted. We must go on then to summon the determination through prayer for God to change this wrong attitude. Having dealt with the subconscious, I want us now to think about our thoughts within the ecclesia. Proverbs 27 verse 3 reads, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So never mind what clothes I have on. I have on a tie now and a blue shirt and what have you. That's not the real David Andrews. The real David Andrews is how I think. And usually that is only, that is so well guarded. It only comes out when I'm under pressure. And that subconsciously, my mind will betray who I really am. This is standard for each and every one of us, brethren, not just for me or the, those closest to me. Acts chapter 6, verse 1, brings out this point. It reads, and in those days, when the number of disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows, the Grecian widows, the foreign Jewish widows, were neglected in the daily administration. And that is the distribution of the welfare money. Let's put it flatly in the vernacular. The welfare money was being distributed to the needy. And somehow in this ecclesia that's so fresh, young and innocent, those Jews, the foreign Jews who were called Grecian Jews were being discriminated by the local Jews or the Hebrew Jews. Then here we see that within the church, there was president, uh, prejudice. This tells us nowhere is prejudice exempt. Now, we cannot control a thought from entering our mind. Brethren, you have to accept this. We cannot control a thought from entering our mind, but we can control which thoughts we accept. We can control which thoughts we accept. Jesus, immediately after his baptism, was driven by God into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. That is to say, his flesh. He could not stop himself from thinking, command these stones to be turned into bread. But he could come to the evil thought, the adversarial thought with the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone. That is our disposition, brethren. That's our weapon. This proves that a thought does not become sin until we accept the thought. Jesus rejected those tempting thoughts by immediately quoting the scriptures. How can we call the word of God to our assistance if we cannot recall what the Bible has to say of evil thoughts? How can we know what God says if it says it's evil if we do not read his word. Another example is to be found in the story of Eli and his family life. That is within the home. And here's where we have a chance to look at our homes without anyone judging us and without us judging anyone else. First Samuel 2, 22 to 24 tells us about Eli. Eli was as a high priest of God, allowing his two sons to get away with sacrilege until it was too late. After a while, he could no longer correct them, only speak feeble words of disappointment. Verse 22 reads, I'm going to read from 22 to 24. 
Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how he lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all the people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. We must make a positive effort, brethren, to set the right example from the very onset within our home, our own workplace, our own ecclesia. We need to teach our families how to recognize prejudice and openly label it for what it is. It is evil, ab abhorrent to the, word of, to, to the word of God, as Brother Dale correctly pointed out. If we wait until our kids are grown, we would have missed the bus. That's the philosophy of us huh? sometimes, aren't we? Oh, well, I don't want to brainwash my children. Let them come to their own conclusion when they are grown. But the world is not making that excuse to them. The world is mercilessly impressing upon their minds its own coats, its own clothing and garments. The best time to impress upon our children is, again, around the family reading of God's word. Take a firm grip of this priceless habit, brethren. Indeed, make it a habit every day. What is the excuse we don't have for doing the readings? Don't have time. Of course, there are some of, some of us who work shift systems. I must admit that it becomes very difficult at that time. But perhaps if you, you, you put your heads together, the heads of the home, along with the children, something can be worked out when some time can be spent together. That's only when you really have a family, when you spend time together. Or else we're just a biological family. Our kids must also see us practice sincere love and openness, regardless of race. If we consistently practice Christ-like behavior, others cannot help but notice it. And after a time, brethren, it will bear fruit. As, soon, as surely as that sun will rise tomorrow, forgive me if it sounds like if I'm swearing, as surely as that sun will rise tomorrow, if you practice Christly behavior in your home, sooner or later, it will bear good fruit. There's not a, a perhaps about it. On the other hand, if we practice unchristlike behavior one day, maybe later down in our lives, we will be judged for it when our children throw, throw it back in our faces. Oh, it was okay for you to do it when, then, mom and dad, during your time. But how come now it is wrong for us? Are we being like Eli and taking the easy road because we do not want to brainwash our children? So we made two stands up, my child, do as I say, not as I do. The solution then is that we must have positive thoughts at the ready, as Jesus did in the wilderness, to counter negative ones. You cannot stop a good or bad thought from coming to your mind. That door doesn't belong to us. But what we accept as our guest is very important. Those positive ones come from the lips of Christ. Make a habit of reading God's word daily. It is our daily food. It is our online reminder of good and evil. Without it, we would die spiritually, just as we die from lack of natural food. One of the best methods is to engage the entire family around the dinner table, if possible, every day. The family that eats together stays together. So does the family that prays and worships together. You see why Christadelphians make a big thing about marrying out of the faith? When you marry out of the faith, I mean, at the beginning of the relationship, it's all hugs and kisses and everybody is seeing starry eyed. Go back three years later. It has to be by the grace of God that things remain the same. You must have moved on to a, a, a deeper 
understanding or disposition of that love, which at the beginning you thought force was love, but now you move from the eros to the agape love, a higher form of sacrificial and Christ-like love. Sharing in God's word is like sharing food. It is the best chance we have of winning our kids from the world if we do not point them in that di direction, in the right direction each day. The time will soon be too late. Okay, we watched our thoughts. I want us now to watch our words. Proverbs 18, verses 6 to 8 reads, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth call it for strokes. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. The words of a bear are his wounds, and they go down into, into the innermost parts of the belly. What about when no one else is hearing us, brethren? This is the litmus test. What happens, what comes out of our mouth when we are sure no one else is hearing us? How do we refer to other ethnicities and races? Do we use slang words? N words, you don't need me to tell you what that is. Or other words to describe them, or even to describe your own race. I have heard some describe their own in the most venomous terms, but suddenly they become righteous when others of a different race do the same to them. I have seen far too many cases of some who treat their own in a most cruel and barbaric and abominable manner but expect others to treat them with respect. All the time, our children are watching and learning and looking for the chance to speak and do like mom and dad. We do not realize that when we curse ourselves, we are helping to institutionalize the evil. When we use those words, we, we ourselves are supposed consciously turning fiction into fact. Every time we repeat those slurs, it takes a mind, it takes on a mind of its own. And after a time, it becomes almost impossible to turn back the clock. Simply passing laws are not sufficient. We all have to change. There's a convention that says a law is not a law unless it can be enforced. So you can make all the laws you want. Unless the law can be enforced for all practical purposes, it's not a law. Yes, it sounds a little strange, but my lecturer told me that and I proved it true. We usually say hurtful things to put others in their place because we feel superior or to hit back harder because we were hurt. So the solution then I submit, brethren, let us make positive efforts to eliminate slurs and scorn from our own mentality and adorn our conversations with the positive, as if our Lord Jesus Christ was there in the present while we were speaking, and he is. Why not say complimentary things? Even if you are struggling to believe it yourself, even if you have a, 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 a wrestling within your mind whether your hearers are deserving, it's better to say complimentary things than hurtful things. Even when others hurt us, better yet, pray for their understanding and repentance. I think we all know what Proverbs 25 11 says. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Let's move on now to our actions. We know very well the convention. They speak louder than words. You know, some people like to say, don't judge me. Only God could judge me. But the Bible tells us that we have to judge and judge righteous judgment. We are not allowed to judge our brother's motives. We can't do that. But if they consistently behave a certain way, it's not for you to judge them. 
Their actions are judging them. The way they carry themselves, the thing they speak, that is exposing what is in the mind. You don't have to do any judgment at all. Matthew 21, verse 28, Jesus brings up this little parable. He says, but what do you think? A certain man had two sons. He came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. The corollary to that is that he went to the other one and the other one says, yes, sir, I will go. But he never went. Does the, someone have to judge him? His actions judged him and you, we know very well which one did the will of the father. It is by our actions we glorify God or drag our Lord's name through the mud. We should be positive and proactive in our behavior. Not do the wrong because we know we feel no one can prove that we are wrong. You know, that's the usual defense. Well, prove me wrong. That's what they do in parliament. That's what they do in Congress. That's what they do. Leaders do all that over the place. And the, and the, and the underlings, if I may be allowed to use that word, they, what they call the underlings, um, approve of the same thing. I do not wish to make myself an example here. We need to share an experience, brethren. I know someone, whenever they were stopped by the traffic police, does not wait for them to ask for their documents. They would immediately lower their car window, turn on their roof, their roof lights if it's night, or take off their sunshades if it is day, and greet the police with a good day, sir. This never fails to disarm them. And almost always, they would wave the person on. And do not proceed without wishing them a blessed day. If we carry our, con if we carry or conduct ourselves in an unacceptable way, we are sure to make a negative impression on others and get a negative response. That is the simplest one-on-one -on -one make two. One of the hardest things to do is to translate Christ-like behavior toward children who are well into the world and have begun to copy their ways. Maybe at school, from the time you place your child in a kindergarten school, they've begun to copy the ways of the world. Unintentionally, they can do little about it. They begin to see what other little children do, uh, what they are learned in their homes. Maybe the parents use expletives <laughs> and they are quick to catch a thorn. Of that, I can tell you. Until Christ comes, democracy is the next best thing. And, uh, and Brother Eon rightly points out that democracy is filled with holes when we come to the human system. But it's the next best thing we have. But should we do wrong? knowing that our victims cannot prove it, or we can knowingly engage in wrongdoing while hiding behind our democratic rights. But God knows our hearts. On the other hand, would we invite a black brother or sister to our homes for lunch after memorial service, or find a good reason why someone else should do it? Would we give up our bed for another brother or sister to sleep, especially if they are a stranger and they do not conform to our culture, or what we understand, what, what we readily accept. Brother and sister, myself and sister June have been regular recipients of such hospitality. And I cannot think of a single instance where we have not been well received into the homes of our brethren and sisters where we have traveled, whether it's North America, Canada, wherever. But I cannot speak for everyone else. Let us try harder to be doers of the word. Translate our new positive thinking to positive behavior when actual situations confront us to prove our true discipleship. What about when others do us wrong? How should we respond? The way of the flesh, I might have hinted earlier, 
is not just to get even when somebody hurt us, but to do back and worse, to stamp your authority upon them and let them know who's the boss. This has been the way of the world from the beginning of time, since Cain killed his brother. So somebody tells you something bad and you curse their parents. The other person runs for a piece of wood to lash off your head. When he sees that, he runs for a gun. <laughs> and then you run for all your friends who may have guns. You see what I'm saying? It's not going to, well, I'm going to let the, the punishment fit what I perceive as a crime. It's to eliminate. That's the inner intention, to eliminate those that have hurt us. We do not want to see them in front of us. It's a dreadful evil and weakness of the human system. Let's look at the Lord Jesus. The writer to the Hebrews says, for consider him that endured such contradiction. Contradiction there means hostility. Consider him that endured such hostility of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood the striving against sin. That is, you in, in our struggle to oppose the sin, we have not really paid any ultimate price. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when you are rebuked of him. This path is not always easy to follow and calls for much patience and endurance. We accept by faith that those who trust in the Lord will eventually triumph. Those who take to the sword will not only die by the sword, but they will also die without hope. In a physical fight, the physically strongest is more likely to win. Perhaps that is one reason why many have been fighting, losing battles for decades now. You cannot win the enemy on their own turf if they have the strength. We need to find a different champion, brethren, one who has already overcome. The world has seen many attempted saviors, and I don't have to list them here for you. I think you know what I'm talking about, of all races, but none has brought a salvation that reached beyond the mortal horizon. We have found the champion, the only one without moral blemish. Jesus says in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus was not yet entered into his kingdom. He's yet to return. He was still gentle Jesus, as we say, but he had overcome because he did what the Father required of him. Christ is our champion, brethren, one who has overcome the tribulations of life, prejudice, and death itself. While suffering the worst, he prayed, Father, forgive them. We read those words flatly as if he's speaking it on a platform, but I can tell you he would have eked out those words on the tremendous and extreme and excruciating pain because he was nailed to the cross when those words were being spoken. Only those who have met Christ, figuratively speaking, of course, like those who have embraced him and stuck with him know his power of non-resistance. We too can and will overcome through the same word of power. Only the word of God has the answer to make a complete stranger, a, a complete change, sorry, of the human heart, beginning with ourselves. And I want us to note that, beginning with ourselves. Don't look at it, the person. Let's begin with ourselves. The word of God demonstrates repeatedly that without it, an intelligent man can easily become a beast in human form. An intelligent man without the word of God can easily become a beast in human form. If you want to check the veracity of those words, we can go to Ecclesiastes chapter three at verses 18 and 19. 
That's what happens when we fall into uncontrolled anger and passions. Or where we have totally our own way and we're never instructed in the way of righteousness. The solution is we must go right back to where Brother Nigel taught us this morning. That is the story of the pride of life. We must ensure that having preached against racism, against prejudice and discrimination to others, we as brethren in Christ must not allow this cancer to enter our own body. I'm not saying it has, but we have to put our guard up. Why? Because we're human. This is our primary concern today with the holding of this little conference. History has proven that hate breeds only one thing, more hate. And the one with the biggest sword usually wins. Only their turn comes around, sorry, until their turn comes around and the futile but deadly cycle continues. Indeed, whether or not we surrender to Christ, God Almighty has already set the day of deliverance. Sadly, only a few will accept the call, as Noah did, as Abraham did. We read in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, at verse 31, God had appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man he had ordained. That is, Jesus, the anointed. Isaiah prophesies a time when Christ will return and make a lasting change for which the world groans. Isaiah 65, I'll read a few verses from verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die in a hundred years old, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. They shall build the houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat of the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of Yahweh, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and the dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, said the Lord. Finally, our advice to all who are hurting, to all who are puzzled and justifiably angry, especially our young people, do not, do not lose hope. Do not lose the hope, capital H for hope. Do not take rash advice. Rather, let us press ourselves to continue in patient waiting on our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. My previous speaker, Brother Eon Neblet, quoted from Isaiah 40, verse 31. I will not go into it, but just to, just to remark that they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. If we obey Christ's commands while we wait, he will watch over our interests. He will watch over our family. He will fight our cause in his own way until he comes to gather together the faithful. He is presently in heaven. And he too is patiently awaiting his father's signal 
to return and fulfill the will of the eternal God declared since the Garden of Eden when man first fell into sin. If we are to give up now, brethren, and to take matters into our own hands, a most tempting prospect, and take the natural solution that calls for no faith, then all that we already have labored and sacrificed for since our baptism into the saving name would have been in vain. Hear what the Apostle Paul warned, and he warns himself. I repeat, he warned himself in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. I must beat my own body until I can control it, lest that by any means, after having preached the gospel to others, I myself should become a castaway. What penetrating logic. What emotion stirring words that we can look in the mirror of the word of God and see what it directs us to do in a language that we can all understand. Brethren, let us keep the focus of the gospel and the return of our Lord Jesus Christ to establish the kingdom of God. Do not be sidetracked at this late stage. The world is moving faster and faster into crisis. The, 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 the return of a Lord cannot be a long way off. Yes, the world is full of prejudice, but let us keep it outside of the brotherhood. We of ourselves cannot make the permanent changes necessary out there, but we can do something. What happens within? May our lamps be at the ready as the five wise virgins. Building ourselves up in our most holy faith, as quoted by Brother Nigel, until Christ returns to transform this evil world into the heavenly paradise promised in the Lord's prayer. To make our vile bodies like unto his glorious body. May God bless us in this determination. Thank you, my dear brethren and sisters. Thank you very much, Brother David. Very well put. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we have had four very informative sessions today. Brother Nigel brought out quite eloquently the nature of man is faulty, full of pride over his fellow man. If there were no blacks to take advantage of, then humans would have found someone else to afflict and oppress. And they have over the years tortured their own when no one else is around. That is just the sad nature of man. And it simply brings out how much we need Jesus as he's the only one who can bring about the much needed change. Brother Dale showed us how even though the scriptures are full of racism god does not advocate racism as, as viewed through modern eyes and god is the creator and owner of mankind in a sense we brothers and sisters in christ young people are his slaves only with a different slave master we, we are designed for his glory uh, since the lord sinai was abolished and grace has come in we need to treat all humans the same and we need to exercise a patience greater than job's in a wisdom greater than solomon's until our master returns to renew all things so restraint 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 and there's a verse that we all know so very well the times of ignorance god has winked at but now commanded all men everywhere to repent brother ian dealt with our call to overcome racism we have an elevated view, he said, a bird's eye view that must be shared with the world. We are called upon to be ruled by, by agape love for our friends, our neighbors, or even our enemies. Condemn the evil that we see in others and share our hope, our faith. Not everyone will, will, will welcome our message, he said, but we have to allow God's word to work um, allow god to work out events in the world not not try to go against his plan and finally as we just heard from brother david 
he gave us some practical bible based ways to deal with racism uh ways that we can all apply to defeat what men have turned into a modern day evil uh sin only becomes sin when we break the existing laws of god using the examples of of eli uh we must lead a godly life train up our children in the, in the ways of god not like eli did and giving rise to good fruit and again exercising restraint and politeness in dealing with, with what could turn out to be negative situations when we are wronged our concern is not getting the bigger weapons and so that in a nutshell is what we had today